Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for those connected today. Welcome and thank you for joining our virtual event, Breaking Ground, Advances on the Path Towards Gender Equality in Higher Education, Leadership and STEM, in celebration of International Women's Day 2024. This event is jointly organized by the UNESCO Regional Office of Southern Africa and the UNESCO International Institute for Higher Education in Latin America and the Caribbean, YESALC. I am Sara Maneiro, Communication Specialist at UNESCO YESALC, and I will be moderating this webinar. This event will be conducted in English with simultaneous interpretation to Spanish. Si necesita traducción, por favor, activar el botón en el menú inferior para español. We would also like to remind you that this event will be recorded and later published on the UNESCO YESALC YouTube channel. Let me provide a brief overview of today's agenda. Our session will start with welcoming remarks from the directors at UNESCO YESALC and at UNESCO office in Harare followed by two panels to discuss the advancements of women's participation in higher education in Southern Africa and about the successful interventions on improving women's participation in higher education. We will then proceed to an exchange of reflections on several relevant questions and the webinar will conclude with the remarks by the head of education at the UNESCO Regional Office of Southern Africa. Before starting today's program, we kindly request two panelists to mute their microphones when not participating. We will start with welcoming remarks by Nisha, director and representative at the UNESCO Regional Office for Southern Africa in Harare. Ms. Nisha was able to join the webinar live, but kindly shared a pre-recorded video presentation with us. So let's, let us hear Nisha's report. I'm from the sunny side of the world, the Victoria Falls World Heritage Site, and a good morning to all. Please excuse me for not having a good voice today but I hope you would be able to understand what I'm saying. While UNESCO at the headquarters is kicking a football to score a goal for women today, we decided to break another ground by presenting advances towards gender equality in higher education leadership and STEM to you. According to the World Science Report, towards 2030, women make up only about 28% of the global researchers in higher education. There is initially about 53% of women in undergraduate degrees and master's level programs. But this rate declines to 43% at the PhD level and begins to evaporate to stand at 28% of the total researchers in higher education. This, as you would know, is called the dreaded leaky pipe syndrome. If we look at engineering and technology, the figures are all the more dismal. At a moment when every sector of the economy and different parts of society are becoming technology driven and are being shaped by emerging newer technologies, There are huge gaps as far as gender equality in digital technologies is concerned, particularly in the field of artificial 
intelligence. Today, women and girls account for 25% of those who are less likely compared to men to know how to use or leverage digital technologies for basic purposes. Four times less likely to know how to program computers and 13 times less likely to file for an ICT patent. Question often is asked, why should we bother about it? What is the importance of having women in STEM? There are several reasons, but first, the most commonly understood reason is that it makes an economic sense. According to the uh, World Economic Forum's Global Gender Gap Report, raising women's workforce participation to the same level as men for many countries would raise the GDP per capita by significant amounts. For example, in Egypt by 34%. Similarly, the International Monetary Fund predicts that if the number of male and female workers were equal in the United States of America, Japan and India, there would be 5% growth of GDP in the USA. Japan would likely see a 9% progress and India's GDP would have an important increase of 27%. In an age when technology rules, bringing another 600 million women online could contribute to around 13 to 18 billion dollars to annual GDP across 144 developing countries. To determine the situation of women in STEM and higher education in Southern Africa, we have completed a background study the study used largely secondary research tools in nine countries to determine the role that women in higher education currently play. And how many of them pursue studies and careers in STEM? This study was important from the perspective of understanding the status of the nine countries in Southern Africa within the larger picture that I presented earlier. The program today will involve a discussion on the results of this survey. And we hope that this discussion and the outcomes that we will get at the end of the discussions will help us devise ways to contribute to improve capacities for reaching out to women, for enhancing women's rates of participation and leadership in higher education institutions and in STEM. With this, let me welcome you again and wish you a very good discussion. I'm looking forward to hearing about 
and learning from the outcomes of this meeting and recommendations that you have to share with us. Thank you again for having me here and wish you a very good discussion. Thanks to Ms. Nisha for her remarks and for highlighting the influential role women's workforce participation can play in raising the GDP per capita in some countries. Next on the agenda, we will have welcoming remarks by uh, Dr. Frances Pedro, UNESCO YESAL Director. Over to you, Dr. Pedro. Thank you very much. Um, and I would like to start by expressing our gratitude to the teams both at uh, the regional office for Southern Africa, the ROSA, which by the way, in my mother tongue, sounds like this wonderful name of the flower rose. Okay? So it's really a pleasure to work with uh, colleagues working under such a beautiful and uh, female, uh, in a way, uh, name, um, but also my colleagues at, uh, at, at the Institute. I think that um, what we are presenting today is uh, an example of how well uh, UNESCO works, particularly in the Global South, fostering the cooperation among regions. Now, um, I would like to stress that despite our cultural differences, our traditions, we share also a number of concerns and precisely uh, gender equality and the, um, in a way, the glass ceiling that we have in two particular areas, uh, women, uh, women's access to leadership in higher education and women's access to STEM uh, careers, particularly in the academic world, represent really one major concern that we share across the global South. I would like to stress as well one very important point. Now, um, Nisha, the director of uh, ROSA, has uh, highlighted the importance of uh, uh, breaking ground when it comes to this particular issue. But um, I would like to compliment what she has said and add at the same time that irrespective of the economic uh, benefits, we have to think of the access to leadership in terms as well of, first of all, the right to every individual to pursue whatever career also in the academic world. And then uh, in, also in terms of uh, social uh, justice, because at the end of the day, we always say that we cannot leave anyone behind. But the matter of fact, when it comes to academic leadership and we come, when it comes to STEM careers, we are leaving many, many colleagues behind. And all of them uh, seem to uh, belong to this particular category, which is the female gender. Now, I think that uh, irrespective of the implications that these equality may have, I think that we are talking about something that really reminds us of the human rights and uh, in particular, the right uh, to education, the right to exercise profession. Now, um, I would like uh, to have uh, as well some comments about the very last and important question. Okay, I know that both teams have been working um, heavily on uh, providing us with a good background study, but at the end of the day, the question for many of us is, so what? So what are we going to do? And particularly, what is UNESCO going to do? We acknowledge that uh, the source of the problem is not really higher education. I mean, we all know that probably the way in which children are educated in families, what preschool education does, what primary and secondary education uh, still continue to do, um, prepare for a world I inequal when it comes, among other things, to uh, gender equality. Now, the question for us should be, what could we do uh, to really improve this situation uh, when people come to our institutions in higher education? And I think that what UNESCO, both uh, of us together, both offices and probably uh, some other colleagues as well in other offices are planning to do, is first of all, make sure that we contribute uh, to disseminate um, the, the drama that, as a matter of fact, we all are experiencing. I mean, making people aware of how difficult the situation is for many women who have the aspiration to become uh, leaders, and deans, uh, department chairs, 
or even rectors and presidents or vice chancellors of universities. I mean, this is really uh, dramatic, as I said, but what can we do? And I think that when it comes to us, we have, other than disseminating the knowledge as we are going to do today, we need really to go one step further and make sure that we contribute to the development of capacities by making sure that we share the best experiences we can find in institutions, telling us the key message that unless you have a dedicated strategy, both in promoting for promoting female leadership in higher education in your institution, or for making sure that starting by the last years of secondary education, you promote examples of successful female scientists. I mean, you are not going to break any ground. And I think that this is precisely what we need to do. We need to look into the future. And I hope that our cooperation, which has been so successful and so rewarding for all the team members, will continue in the future and provide the whole world with uh, examples of what can be done and also opportunities for improving your capacities in that respect. That said, once again, thank you all to, for your participation and also for your contributions. Thank you very much. Back to you, Sarah. And thanks, Dr. Pedro, for stressing the importance uh, of supporting women's participation across the global South and also the right to accessing academic leadership, leadership roles in higher education. Um, for uh, now, after opening uh, the opening of uh, today's dialogue, uh, we will proceed to our first panel, Women in Higher Education in Southern Africa Advancements. And we would like to welcome Daniele Vieira, Assistant Professor at the Federal University of Pernambuco in Brazil and former UNESCO staff in the education sector. The floor is yours, Daniele. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for the introduction. Could you just please confirm you can hear me well? Yes, we can hear you well. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you for the invitation. Um, I would like to greet the other speakers of this year's um, webinar and also the audience who is here with us today for this year's um, International Women's Day um, webinar workshop. Uh, we've been developing for a couple of years now together with UNESCO a series of um, initiatives and projects to understand a little bit the dynamic of women, gender, and higher education, the participation of women in higher education in several domains. So we've been developing initiatives to assess, for example, um, participation of women in leadership and the enrollment rates in general of male and females um, inside the, the, the institutions in all the UNESCO regions. Uh, we have been assessing the participation in bachelor comparing to postdoctoral degrees. Uh, we have been looking to our uh, working conditions. And more recently, we have um, um, turned a little bit to look into more detailed the STEM areas. Um, and I would like to share with you three important milestones um, in these initiatives um, inside UNESCO regarding uh, women in higher education. The first one is that in 2021, we had this global report um, on the topic of enrollment inside higher education. And then in this report in 2021, we found that uh, we have increased the enrollment rates of women in general, with the exception of the African region. As a result of that, we have decided um, later in 2022 to develop more research and assessments looking to more the African scenario. And then we started first with three countries initially. This was done in 2023 when we launched last year the report um, that looks into Kenya's, South Sudan and Uganda's um, scenario. And then in this report, this has been launched last year. Maybe some of the um, persons who are with us in the audience today has been following um, these initiatives. And then we highlight some of the aspects, um, not only in, in terms of enrollment, but the other aspects in terms of um, the women's participation in general in higher education in these three selected countries. We have decided to go further. And then this year, um, most probably in May, we will be launching a third uh, report on that. We have expanded that. Our colleagues from um, Harare office are here. 
Um, they are partnering with uh, UNESCO ALZALG in developing this initiative. And then now we decided to look into more detail um, to explore, for example, the aspect of STEM and also more specifically the aspect of leadership and the working condition of uh, women in some um, institutions. We have so far data from 38 institutions in nine um, selected countries in the southern uh, region of Africa. These include Malawi, Zambia, Zimbabwe, Namibia, Botswana, South Africa, Lesotho, Eswatini, and Mozambique. And um, as I said, we are going to be launching um, the report um, in two months' time. I don't want to um, spoil all the um, results of the um, report here, but I think there are some positive findings that we would like to share with you. Um, the first one um, regards the policy um, um, areas of some of these um, countries that we have assessed. So when we look, for example, to a more normative level, level we see that we have some significant um, um, initiatives being developed, policy being policies being developed. They look into more um, detail the aspect of gender equality. So just to highlight two aspects, we have, for example, Botswana that has developed in 2015, a national policy on gender and development. This policy provides a, a good framework for mainstreaming gender, not only in higher education, but in all sectors, including, of course, education. And then as a result of this policy, there was some, um, as according to um, the results we uh, achieved in the report, some significant progress in terms of interventions, for example, to address um, gender-based stereotypes or to address projects that look into the role representation of females in the TVET, but also in the STEM subjects. So there were some initiatives being developed since 2015 as a result of this national policy on gender and development. Um, another aspect that we um, could highlight when we look into this uh, policy area or this normative level refers, for example, to South Africa. South Africa has a, a, a distinct scenario, Rovani, our colleague from UNESCO Harari will probably touch that, um, um, a significant, um, um, a, a distinct scenario comparing to the other eight countries in the region. Um, and in 20, um, 2001, they created the National Plan for Higher Education. And then inside this plan, for example, they have also recognized some aspects of gender inequalities as a concern um, for the country, and then have been also developing um, some specific measures as part of this national plan to look into um, the inequalities that still exist. So there is, of course, uh, uh, we would say uh, an enabling policy framework and environment that have been, has been um, developed inside the country since a couple of years until now. And then this um, normative scenario, of course, is being supporting some specific, um, um, specific initiatives on the ground to um, increase at least the participation of women in, in higher education. And we can see that um, in some of the results of our um, report. And then what we see is that um, according to, um, we have a red saw in other uh, UNESCO regions, we compared the years of 2018 with 2021. So we, we, we wanted to look into data before and after the pandemic. And what we saw is that there was an increase in the women enrollment. Of course, it's still lower or significantly lower than the rates that we see in the other regions. But when we look specifically only to the African region, we see that there is a, a, a uh, an expansion of the participation of women in these higher education institutions, they were um, um, studied. And the enrollment effect in these institutions are higher than the ones from their uh, male colleagues in the nine countries in Southern Africa that we have analyzed. I also wanted to um, highlight or call the attention to the fact that we are talking about here um, a bachelor's um, um, students, right? Um, a bachelor female students. Uh, we see a slightly different um, scenario when we go a little bit more in seniority inside those um, institutions. But still, we, we see this as a positive finding in comparison to the initial report that we had in 2021. So in fact, there has been an expansion, even if it's lower than uh, comparing um, to other reasons, uh, to other regions. Um, different from the other phases of the project, now also uh, more recently with these nine uh, Southern African countries, we try to look a little bit more in the aspect of the working conditions of, of, of these um, uh, male um, um, women inside these institutions. So what are the criteria, for example, for appointing the women or what are the um, uh, working conditions that they encounter once they enter these institutions? 
And although um, they are still not taking um, most of the leaderships, or, or we don't see still parity in the leadership positions inside the report institutions, although this is still the case, according to the data that we have, including, of course, the STEM areas, um, according to the data that we had, on average, the respondents, they were quite positive um, um, in terms of they agree or strongly agree, for example, that they don't feel that there is a bias in the appointment of women. So they see, for example, that most of the institutions, they have the principle of equal payment for, for, for equal work, that the women receive um, good um, social benefits, so the same social benefits that their colleagues in terms of pensions, medical insurance, holidays, most of the institutions reported that they have maternity benefits for women, although, of course, the, the paternity benefits are still, uh, 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 of course, for the males whose spouses have given birth, it's still a point of uh, of concern. Uh, but still, we see this as um, some um, key positive elements that we would like to share. Of course, there are many persisting um, and challenges. Um, as I said, we are going to be launching this document very soon, and we welcome everybody to follow our um, social media and other news to know when the, the document, the final study is out. Of course, we see still some challenges in terms of um, levels of seniority, postdoctoral levels, and now so more specifically in the STEM um, disciplines, which is um, some of the aspects that my colleague Rovani will um, focus now on her presentation. So we just wanted to um, call the attention this year for some of the positive findings that we have and now we are moving into a next phase of the research to look into more detail, particularly in the uh, aspect of STEM. When we look into the STEM disciplines, the Tibet discipline subject, what are they still, what, what is the scenario there? So this is a work in progress um, that we have. As I said, we just wanted to highlight some of the this year's more positive findings and welcome, of course, everybody to um, have a look on the final document once this is out. I will stop here, Asara, thank you very much and happy International Women's Day to everyone. Thanks, Daniele, for sharing the highlights of the most recent research projects around the condition of African women in higher education institutions, which by the way are available on UNESCO's library and on our website. Um, let's now turn to Rovani Sigamoni, a chemical environmental engineer from South Africa and now part of the education team at the UNESCO Regional Office for Southern Africa. Over to you, Ms. Rigamon. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, I'd like to share my screen um, just to show you a few slides about what I am going to concentrate on, specifically um, in terms of women in engineering in Southern Africa and um, talking about what we are doing in uh, advancements going forward. So what we find is that, let's see. sorry, one second, it seems that my slides are, we find yeah, that, we Okay, so now it's moving. Thanks, sir. We find that we have um, women and girls who continue to be excluded from participating fully in science and STEM as a whole. Um, according to a UN study conducted in 14 countries, the probability for female students to graduate with a bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degree in science-related fields are 18, 8, and 2% respectively, while the percentages of male students are 37, 18, and 6%. What I'm going to do is give you a snapshot of uh, where we are and then the advances we are making and going forward. So according to the World Economic Forum in their Global Gender Gap Index of 2023, we find that the, the gender gap is back to 2019 levels. And we find that in STEM around the world, the representation of women across the seniority levels uh, in STEM versus non-STEM occupations is really large. I think Danielle also touched on this in the results of our uh, study going forward that will come out in the report. When we look at UNESCO and the girls uh, in STEM education, uh, we find the challenges are that we have a decrease in the interest among youth in studying STEM. It's just not a gender problem, but it is worse among girls. And we find that STEM is stereotyped as male dominated. 
we need to change mindsets, communities, and gender role stereotypes about girls and women in these fields. Uh, there's a need for strong women role models in STEM that encourage young women to take up scientific careers. And it was also about um, raising families and going forward in doing research and, and how women can benefit. So looking at students in tertiary education, and Danielle has touched on this as well, we find that around the world, there are more women in tertiary education than men, but in sub-Saharan Africa, there are more uh, men than women in university. The good news for our study, um, although we need to go delve deeper in the next phase, is that we find that in Southern Africa, in the nine countries that we studied, there are more women than men at university. This is something that was touched in uh, on in the opening speech of the director of Rosa, where we have we find the leaky pipe syndrome for women researchers, where there are only around twenty eight percent of female researchers around the world. And then when we look at the participation of women in research and STEM, and this is from the Progress on Sustainable Development Goals, the Gender Snapshot 2023 report, we find that only one in three women are researchers. Women hold less than 25% of careers in science, engineering, and ICT. A mere 17% of inventors in international patents were women, compared to 83% of men. And women are two times less likely than men to know how to write a computer program. When we look at women in STEM, we find that in 2023, the gender cap in STEM remains significant, where women make up only 28% of the STEM workforce worldwide. We have 24% in the US, 17% in the European Union, 16% in Japan, 14% in India, and only 13% in South Africa, one of the countries in our study. And we find that is, is even lower of only 7% in engineering. Computer science also shows a steady decrease in female graduates since 2000. So what are we doing about this? So this is where ISALC and UNESCO ROSA comes in, where we're doing the study, starting with Southern Africa. But as uh, Danielle said, there was also a study on women in higher education in other countries in Africa. So concentrating on STEM, these are the countries that were part of the study. And we look at STEM faculty management positions, and we find that these are largely dominated by men. And this actually correlates with the graph that we saw earlier about women and men um, in, non, in STEM careers at higher levels. When we look at student enrollments, we find that um, less than 40% of uh, young girls or young women are part of uh, or registered in STEM careers at the universities in the nine countries that were part of our survey. Um, and, however, a positive trend is that we can see that there is an increase in the number of young women in Southern Africa. And so we are hoping that going further, we can also continue to monitor, monitor this with more data to ensure that we this trend increases on a positive note. Well, so what do we do to get more young women in STEM? And this is also part of the positive uh, recommendations from the report, where we look at empowering young women with knowledge and information about engineering and science so that they can make informed decisions in their chosen path of study and careers. As was mentioned by um, the director, Frances Pedro, everyone should have a choice of what they want to study, but we do need to give them the knowledge and information of what is out there. We need to develop strong institutional policies and establish gender equality plans. We need to ensure that there is no gender bias in technology and devices for girls and boys, especially when they are younger. We need to develop tools for data collection in STEM, especially disaggregated data, which we do not really find in engineering. We need training mentors and programs to encourage young women to take up STEM. And this includes also having um, grants available for young people to study. We need recruitment, recruitment and promotion target systems for women in management in STEM. We need exclusive research funds for women in STEM. 
institutional and childcare support in terms of mentoring childcare facilities that will also aid women who continue to do their PhD and postdoctorates in terms of STEM uh, careers. And we need retention monitoring systems to ensure that targets are met, such as the UN Sustainable Development Goals, the Agenda 2063 of the African Union, and other systems that we work with. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Rovani, uh, for sharing uh, this data on gender gap in STEM globally and also the challenges ahead and also the recommendations for making progress towards a more equal scenario. Uh, we now proceed to the second panel. Successful interventions on improving women's participation in higher education. Please uh, join me in welcoming Ms. Roberta Mali Bassett to share her insights. Ms. Mali Bassett is the global lead for tertiary education and senior education specialist at the World Bank, where she provides coordinated oversight to the World Bank's expanding lending and analytical efforts, supporting post-secondary education reforms around the world. Ms. Mali Bassett, over to you. Thanks so much, Sarah. And thank you again to Ilfac and UNESCO for this invitation to present today. It's really an honor to be part of International Women's Day event, especially focused on Africa. So I also have a presentation and I will share my screen. Um, I've been asked to speak on successful interventions. We have done work uh, all over the world, as many of you know, but recently we produced a study uh, utilizing EU funds um, to support uh, an analysis of women in leadership positions, but not necessarily in higher education, leadership positions very broadly. So um, I think this is working, yes. So we actually have received from governments across the world. And again, I'm going to focus on Sub-Saharan Africa, given the hosts of this uh, event today. But many countries have established in their constitutions or their legislative environments sort of quotas for women in representational um, leadership positions, whether that be parliamentary positions, positions as CEOs or high-level managers in private sector organizations. And so there's a big question on what is the role of higher education in developing women into those spaces? And what is the, what are the obstacles that are keeping them out of that? And so here I'm going to present a little bit of information about the World Bank's portfolio in higher education and tertiary education, just to contextualize our work so that there's a sort of an understanding among the audience about what we do. And then I'm going to go into some key facts that we have um, garnered through our research on women uh, in their educational outcomes. And then four slides on some key intervention areas that we see as policy areas that can support increasing the number of women in leadership roles through higher education. So first, just some background information on the World Bank's work in tertiary education. This is what is active at the World Bank right now. We have a total of 67 active programs. These are lending programs uh, amounting to right around $7 billion around the world. And you can see here the distribution by who is doing the work from our water sectors, social sustainability, digital development. But the majority of this work in post-secondary education is led by the education practice of which I am a part. Below that, you see the regional distribution, very heavily skewed right now towards Africa, uh, but also, as you can see, there are projects in every major region where we, we have lending programs. The lending instruments, by and large, this will be um, less obvious to those who are unfamiliar with World Bank work, but most of them are very normal loans that are built around activities. We are doing a lot more performance-based financing. That's what the P4R is. So they get uh, results-based dis disbursements on their lending. And I can talk a bit more about that in the Q&A because we are utilizing performance-based financing to drive uh, focus on gender equality in our programs more and more. So I can talk about that during the Q&A. And then the last you can see, it's the distribution of our lending programs around the 
socioeconomic development or the economic status of the countries. So low income to high income countries, the vast majority fall in the middle. Uh, as you can see, lower middle and upper middle income countries uh, receive the preponderance of our programmatic lending in higher education, but low income countries and high income countries are present as well. In this one, again, we see just under $8 billion of lending, same sort of conceptual distribution. We can share the slides later, but um, we are engaged everywhere with increasingly large programs. So I used to work on programs that were $10, $12 million. Now I lead programs that are for 400 and $450 million. And so the scale of our higher education interventions are getting bigger. Uh, that said, in the total portfolio at the bank, tertiary education lending is actually getting smaller, and that's something for another day, but something that actually is indicative of where the global narrative around interventions in lending for higher education reform is moving. So I'm going to just give four facts that we know about the, what's happening with women and gender issues in global tertiary education. And I've highlighted, you can see on the slide, Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, because there's Sub-Saharan Africa is very much an outlier in many of the developments of what's going on with gender around the world. So here you can see Sub-Saharan Africa is, uh, and South Asia are the two big regions of uh, population expansion. We know Sub-Saharan Africa is anticipated to have the vast majority of the global youth population by 2050. And so we see a dramatic expansion of what's coming for the tertiary education sector in Africa. On the right-hand side, you can see, however, that enrollment in secondary and tertiary education is not keeping pace to this expanded youth population. And that tension is the tension that underlies a lot of what we're doing to try to get in front of the challenges that we know are coming for this sector. Here, again, women are also driving growth around the world, except for in Sub-Saharan Africa. So on this slide, you can see the growth of men and women in the two age brackets where we're catching uh, tertiary education achievement, uh, participation and achievement. And you can see for Sub-Saharan Africa, even though the gross numbers in both male and female achievement in tertiary education is growing, the gap is not closing. It's one of the only places where we're not seeing women closing or narrowing the gap in a significant way uh, to men's participation levels. So overall, the picture globally for women is very strong, but in Sub-Saharan Africa, it is not. In fact, three, this one, I think this is what uh, Rami was just saying, um, women's rise is not equal across fields, fields that are high earners, fields that we know are driving the economic development in this new noble, I mean, global knowledge economy, tech-driven expansion. Women are being excluded in large ways from, from this expanded uh, labor force participation. STEM fields, uh, you've already heard this from UNESCO colleague, but women are not keeping pace with men uh, in STEM enrollments, again, particularly in low income countries. But the fact for one is the most important one. Tertiary education is the decisive element in female labor force participation. In regions where women have low labor force participation overall, one of the strongest ways to get women into the workforce is through tertiary education. And this concept is the concept that led to our study on what we can do with higher education to drive forward women being a bigger force in the highest levels of their citizenry, their global political space, their economic driving space. So what can we do to create more women leaders, not just at the university level, but in the private sector and the public sector to be the leaders that little girls see and little boys see as recognizing that this is a space for girls and women in the same way that it is for men. What are the obstacles? What are the opportunities? So we did a study in the Horn of Africa in the last couple of years. It will come out soon. Uh, it's already been reviewed, but again, we have all our processes just like UNESCO does for peer review and uh, evaluating the work. Um, but I have some findings. We came up with six areas of policy interventions that we see as key to really improving the ability of women to utilize higher education as a tool for achieving leadership positions in their societies. And I'm going to focus on four in the interest of time, um, but can talk about more uh, again during the discussion. In the first one, we talk about tertiary education-led initiatives to improve completion and transition 
from pre-tertiary, many forms of that, into the higher skills developed opportunities. And so what we're trying to do more and more with our work is not just to say sort of what is needed, but to also offer what kind of tools and roadmaps are available for policymakers or for activists or for institutional leaders to then put in practice what we're talking about. So we gave three here policy options to consider to achieve the improvement of this bridge from secondary into tertiary. One, as I see here, are the outreach and bridge programs. We had a program in Romania that remains one of our, I think our prize uh, achievements in the region around this, um, in the ECA region, around this question of what can we do to tie secondary schools to universities and improve the participation of those who are missing in large numbers from post-secondary education. Bridge programs are a big one. So it is reaching out to secondary schools, it's doing summer programs that introduce students to the campus community, to the experience of taking college level classes, creating mentorships at the earliest stage possible. Staff and students at the higher education institutions can be part of that conversation in secondary school. The next one is about academic networks. And this really, again, is about getting uh, the networks to knit together between secondary and tertiary uh, institutions so that undergraduate serve as the secondary school students. And likewise, to create a community of opportunity for girls and women that is visible and constant as an experience as they move their way through their educational pipeline. And the third point here is high profile champions. And this is something I think we'll hear a lot about, but we know representation matters. We know we need to see ourselves in the people we aspire to be, to be like. And so we need to find ways to identify those champions and then activate those champions to be part of this conversation. And the next one is making the tertiary education experience itself more women friendly. We know, especially in Sub-Saharan Africa, but of course in many other regions of the world that once they get into the institutions, we lose a disproportionate amount of female students from entry to into the, the gross enrollment rates may be improving in many countries. The graduation rates are not keeping pace with the improvements in gross enrollments. What is stalling progression? Those are key considerations and need to be measured. Some we are recommending to be considered are women-centric spaces and institutions. One of the countries that we worked with is Somalia. Somalia came to the World Bank actually and asked us to consider what, what would a woman's university for leadership be like on the ground in the country. You know, there's, there's a real energy, even in spaces that may seem unlikely to want to support a women's centric institution to focus on what the women experience is like in higher education. So it can be a women's university or a women's college. It can be a subsidiary faculty within an existing institution that allows for safe spaces for academic development and advising for women to engage with each other in a space that feels free and maybe unobserved, but women-centric spaces are very important. Another point we are looking at are flexible modes of learning. This is especially important in countries where Girls are often lost at the secondary level, either through early marriage or uh, early childbirth, but need to be able to have roots back into the post-secondary education system. What can we do with the institutions to build flexibility in their delivery of their courses and their structure of their academic pipeline from entry to graduation that allows more time or potentially even more uh, offline learning, hybrid learning. So we're thinking a lot more with uh, countries about that. And then this third space about sexual abuse, about um, uh, in, insecurity for girls and women on college campuses and in their communities, what can we do to be good stewards of the, this environment of safety and uh, empowerment for girls and women in their educational experience? So that's the point of this one. Moving again now towards progression through the sector and then labor market outcomes, things to consider both at the institutional level and in the labor market as childcare provision and maternity leave rights. What do we do to allow women to lead the lives that they are expected to lead by their culture and their communities while also able to pursue education? In many countries around the world, this is very normal. In many countries where we work, it is not normal. It's, it's defined as very zero sum. You have children, you 
drop out of school. It's very normal. What can we do to allow them to stay in school and then to stay in the workforce? Do we have childcare provision? Are there spaces, lactation spaces, spaces where women can be uh, on their own, spaces where they can leave their children? All of this is very important while they study and when they work. And then this third, I mean, the second point here is around experiential learning. How are we building women friendly experiential learning opportunities during their academic programs, including bridging them into the workforce so that they are as prepared as anyone else to enter the labor market when they are done. Okay, last slide. And then the last one is very World Banky, um, but we actually are constantly pressing for more region, uh, research and diagnostics at the regional, national, and institutional level. Do we have good data on what's happening with girls as they move through the pipeline? Is it enough? It's clearly not enough to know that they enter in the institutions. We need to know what's happening to them when they're there. We need to know how quickly they move through and how many of them finish. And that is data that if, if you are a researcher on the women's experience in higher education in low and lower middle income countries, you know the data is terrible. And so it's very difficult for us to, to tell a legitimate story on what's happening. Um, so we are asking all governments in all of our projects to improve their data development and they are all required to disaggregate by gender. So what is happening on dropouts by gender? What's happening uh, at, at and the re-entry of girls and women? What is done to allow us um, to make evidence-based policy on the experience of women? In this research we did in the Horn of Africa, we mostly did qualitative research because we wanted to get direct um, stories from women and women leaders. We interviewed Congress people, we interviewed CEOs, we interviewed presidents of institutions, all female by and large. And then we had co-gendered co uh, focus groups as well to hear what men and women would talk about around these gender issues um, and, and the barriers that they perceived. And it was extraordinarily helpful because what you see in the data in very often does not match what you hear in the stories. And so both of these things are required to get a full picture of what's happening on the ground. We need to know what the barriers to entry into the labor market are, whether those are cultural, whether those are educational, what, whatever they are so that the policies that come in to intervene are directly uh, related to a problem that is seen and not a perception that we anticipate. And so there's always a big tension between what we think we believe, what we think we know, and what is actually happening on the ground. And the last point is I think what we're doing here today and what I hope all of you who are participating do regularly, which is to have a partnership dialogue space around these issues so that everyone who is engaged in this research topic or in this intervention topic know what the others are doing so that when we're together, we're speaking with a similar evidence space that we can progress uh, in concert with each other and not in conflict, which often happens not because of discord, but because we just don't know what anyone else is doing or we just don't know what interventions are happening. And so we really encourage a re you know, regular stock taking of what's happening on the ground, assessing of the current instruments, really looking at impacts of the programs that are happening and then working together to move forward collectively. And with that, I will stop. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Mali Bassett, for sharing key information about the work that the World Bank is developing in terms of its sending program and the regional distribution of projects and funds and the recommendations in terms of policies for clo closing the gender gap in tertiary education, specifically in the case of women in Africa. Let me now welcome Martha Jess, the founder and CEO of Fair Chance Learning, organization dedicated to fostering growth and education. She holds a master's in critical disability studies from York University. Thank you very much for being with us. The floor is yours, Mark. Thank you, Sarah, and you're okay with my sound? You can hear? Yes. Excellent. So uh, like the other panelists, I'm, I'm honored to be here in this conversation and um, to Roberta's point, the partnership dialogue, as we uh, connected this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you're tuning in from, you know, we have um, a, a thought sharing from um, Switzerland, Zimbabwe, Spain, 
Venezuela and I'm I'm located in Canada. So just the opportunity to come together and have this conversation, uh, I think is it it, it is um, not taken lightly that we're connecting different countries, different research bodies and and different um, organizations around this goal, um, celebrating International Women's Day and thinking about how we can get more women to participate in higher education, tertiary education. Uh, some some key considerations that I just want to uh, highlight for is um, I'm just confirming that my my spoken language is English here. Um, and some key considerations that I've heard throughout the panelists and and that I know through the work that we do here at Fair Chance Learning is if we want to get more females enrolled in higher education and learning opportunities, we really have to think about building that talent pipeline and uh, work on programming and STEM experiences earlier on in their education system. So, you know, we think of the K-12 system and starting students with the, the understanding and the belief and that STEM identity earlier on um, is a really important indicator for them to feeling the confidence to pursue higher education and additional opportunities under the STEM disciplines. Another big piece um, in terms of the capacity uh, that we need to address is educator capacity. So enhancing the educator skills for um, effective STEM teaching. If the educators don't have that skill set, don't have that confidence, then how do we um, how do we encourage that and develop that so that they can bring this into their curriculum? Um, the, the other piece that is important when we think about the opportunities and those who are included in STEM experiences and Ravani spoke to it as well is that, you know, young children, young females are not being included in the STEM programming. And so if we make a concerted effort and a, a dedication from an education policy that, um, STEM curriculum or STEM opportunities are embedded directly into the curriculum. And so, you know, teaching the coding and the computational skills as part of the curriculum means that when students are in the classroom as part of their regular day, they are getting access to that curriculum rather than it being a um, program that you can access through clubs or after school activities, which we know makes an impact in terms of the experiences um, and opportunities for individuals. But as we think about the responsibilities of young females that they have um, to their house, to, to their homes, to their communities, to their families, um, taking time away from that uh, after school experience means that they may be excluded from that. So recognizing that we need to work and focus on the, the time that they are in the formal education system, that we give them opportunity. Uh, the other important piece is around the access to technology and STEM tools. So early on in their learning journey, giving them the tools that they need to explore, whether it's the laptops, the mobile devices, the, the coding devices, uh, making sure that they have the tools available to them um, earlier into their education journey so they can explore that uh, with the mentorship of the educator uh, is an important indicator. And then a couple of, of notes um, that Roberta spoke to is the shifting role of higher education and tertiary education. So how can we look at the conditions to which we invite these, um, these women into the learning environment so they see themselves represented and they can access learning opportunities in a way that suits their um, their needs. So um, knowing that, um, as we uh, Roberta mentioned, the experiential learning um, opportunities, that being a, a piece that um, makes a difference for them, co-op and work-paced learning opportunities so that they're earning an income while they're digging deeper into their skill set and the development. How do we provide more on-ramps into tertiary education? So if the, you know, you think of um, mid-aged women uh, and women who may want to re-enter the workforce or re-enter learning, how do we offer that in a, a way that doesn't feel intimidating or um, full of barriers? How do we remove the barriers for um, the individual women? Uh, also building the, the digital skills and so that they do have um, 
the confidence to access the plethora of open university um, and and massive open online courses that they they have the confidence and the skill set that they can tap into these knowledge networks and and develop their skills uh, that way. Um, another important piece in terms of the the success is is working with the higher education institutions, but also working with industry and and workforce and so if we want uh, higher female participation in the labor force making that connection between um that lifelong learning mindset that organizations really need to orient themselves around uh to offer ongoing learning opportunities for their employees and that connection between academia and in industry is one that we have to i think have more dialogue around making sure that um, going back to the work base and career connected learning opportunities and then all, um, that universal approach to learning so if we if we consider you know the environments that we're setting up um, from a universal perspective, we're addressing accessibility issues. We're, we're talking about the flexibility that's required for women who are um, also the, the head of their families, um, that we, we design for all um, at the onset of the learning experiences and the learning conditions. Uh, so in terms of successful interventions, I just want to highlight three um, that have different perspectives. So one is uh, an event that we, Fair Chance Learning, partnered with Microsoft around um, DigiGirls. And, and the idea um, with Microsoft DigiGirls is it's an industry education partnership to inspire more girls to get into STEM. Um, and what was um, successful about that partnership is that we used our global network of uh, female leaders in technology. So through Microsoft Canada and Microsoft Africa, we connected um, female leaders and it, um, it, from a wide range of uh, career um, and, and career departments and domains. So marketing, technology, um, lawyers. Um, communication, and we brought uh, a, a working group together to say, how can we build a, a boot camp or a, a week-long experience that matters to students and matters to educators? And so we connected students from Kenya, Rwanda, um, Canada, and the United States, and we brought the students together over the course of a week in a variety of ways. We offered workshops, we offered panels, we offered skill, specific skill development in STEM and coding with a platform called uh, Microsoft Make Code and um, the MicroBit. And so students connected one another uh, with one another um, through classrooms to understand the ways in which STEM is being used in um, particular careers and uh, and work together to solve a particular community challenge around the sustainable development goals. And so, you know, offering opportunities that both uh, develop the technical skills, but connect to a larger issue that these, these young women wanted to solve. And we had over 300 classrooms participating. And it was the first time for a lot of students um, that they were ever having a video conference opportunity to connect outside of their community in, in um, Kenya and Rwanda. And that experience was one that uh, laid the foundation for them to ask more questions, to connect with uh, the students across um, Africa and Canada and talk about shared experiences, shared experiences with respect to the, you know, um, the pandemic and how that felt and, and education and how the world was shifting and some of the problems that they were struggling with and seeing the commonality. And so building that community uh, was a really important element. Another um, government approach in Ontario and Canada, uh, there's a government programming called the Skills Development Fund. And with that um, funding, um, Programs have developed, and one of the programs Fair Chance Learning developed is a program called With Achieva, and this is a digital platform, um, learning experience platform that allows uh, individuals to come into a learning environment, sign up at any point, and develop both the technical skills, but the durable transferable skills that we know are equally important in the age of AI 
you know, we've heard it's EQ over IQ uh, in terms of individual success and, and really uh, building your skill set and, and fortifying your career, um, your career skills um, through the durable EQ um, skill sets. So things like being able, emotional learning, um, navigating difficult conversations, the collaboration, creativity, communication, critical thinking, these skills um, are equally important to the STEM and, and technical skills that we're focused on in this conversation um, as we're thinking about getting more females into the labor force. Um, and then just that opportunity again in higher ed, uh, University of Toronto, I was part of a, an expert in residence for a program called Cultivating Entrepreneurship. Um, and it was a fellowship program that was a non-granting degree um, program that uh, 14 weeks in which we took mid-career individuals who were looking to develop their leadership skills and uh, they were guided through an inquiry connected to their, their workplace. So again, that connection between um, the research and the frameworks that help guide their, their learning and their exploration and um, producing through a community of practice um, a, a solution that they were able to take back and implement into their workplace. Um, so uh, those are just some examples and, and I look forward to the conversation now, uh, to, to delve into some of the questions that Sarah, I think you're going to prompt us on. Thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Marta for sharing your considerations specifically in relation to making the connection with STEM from earlier levels of education as part of the curricula of formal education system, and also the importance of getting more access to a community of practice. Also, thanks to our previous panelists for sharing their experiences around successful interventions on improving women's participation in higher education and the advancements achieved. We now proceed to the discussion around some key questions, focusing on strategies and interventions that can foster positive changes in the status of women in higher education. The, fir the first question for our panelists is based on how to ensure that the interventions implemented are sustainable and have a long-term impact on women's inclusion in higher education. We would like to invite uh, Ms. Mali Bassett to begin the discussion on this key topic. And you will have approximately a flexible three minutes to share your reflections. So you can you can extend yourself longer. Sure. The floor so is yours. Thanks very much, Sarah. I will actually try very hard not to stop, talk for more than three minutes. It's helpful to keep it moving. Um, but we do think about this a lot in our programs. And so the idea of sustainability is sort of front and center whenever we come in to approach uh, any kind of intervention. One of the things that we do look at, I mean, World Bank funding by and large is meant to be bridge funding, right? It's bridge between the former state of something and the future ideal of something. But then once you get to that future ideal place, it has to be able to operate without us. And so we start thinking about sustainability in our design. If we are doing funding of infrastructure, for instance, we make sure that the, the client countries have a financing plan that's going to operationalize those infrastructure pieces after we've done doing that. Um, so much of it is having a conversation and ideally something even in writing uh, with the government counterparts that says this is something that's being embedded in the standard operations of the country or of the institution. In the case of gender interventions, one of the things we're doing a lot more uh, at the bank is doing, again, as I was mentioning before, results-based financing so that we actually help working with our governments create targets for achieving gender equity in some form. And a great example of this is our African Centers of Excellence Initiative, which is around $800 million in 20 countries uh, 81 centers of excellence all across sub-Saharan Africa. And in each of the countries where we're operationalizing this African Centers of Excellence project, uh, the countries are given 
results-based financing. So they have to achieve certain indicators that we agree with the country. In each of those, if you, receive, if you achieve certain enrollments of women, you get more funds. And so it incentivizes behaviors that are operationalized before they realize the funding. They know they need to increase the enrollments of women. So they change the way they do recruitment. They change the way they interact uh, with their communities. They change the way they go about uh, recruiting and admission processes and uh, onboarding students, all of those things to achieve certain levels that result in financing coming from their project funds. But the activities themselves are not funded by World Bank projects. Those activities are, are those that are built by the institutions in a way that the institutions own. More and more of that should be done so that they can benefit from the change and the changes are directed from internal uh, by their own leadership. I'll stop there. Thank you, Ms. Mali. That's it. Now we would like to invite uh, Daniele to answer the same question. How to ensure that the interventions implemented are sustainable and have a long-term impact on women's inclusion in higher education? Daniele, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sarah. Um, when you look into the um, initiatives that we have been developing since 2021, one of the difficulties that we found was the availability of data. For example, um, in my intervention um, a couple of minutes ago, I haven't mentioned anything about research and the reasons that we simply could not find data. The data is simply not available. So for, so for example, if we want more women to reach seniority levels or higher levels inside the institutions, leadership, positions inside the institutions. If we want them to move to um, postdoctoral degrees or to study in STEM, we really need to know what is the current situation inside the institutions at the moment. And sometimes looking more specifically into the African scenario, which is where we are focusing right now, sometimes this data is uh, simply not available. So if we want to talk about interventions, they are sustainable. First, we have to understand what is the current scenario. And sometimes this data is simply not there. This reinforces the necessity of more research. Another aspect very important is the aspect of evaluation. Um, how are we going to know if the interventions that we are doing now, they are uh, having positive and last impact, for example, looking to the future. So we need a constant evaluation, a constant monitoring, be it by the national level or be it by the institutional level. Uh, we have developed also um, some initiatives on gender-based violence um, research inside the higher education institutions. And one of the aspects mentioned in this um, research was that uh, most of the respondents have mentioned that the lack of institutional responses, a lack of a monitoring tool, or lack of a, 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 a tool or an instrument inside the institutions where they could report the problem and then this could be evaluated or monitored. The same thing applies, for example, to the participation of women in higher education institutions. So we need more data to know what the current situation is and to have more um, practical on the ground interventions. We need evaluation, right? In a monitoring of the situation. And also, um, I would also say some more collaborative efforts among the institutions, um, also between the institutions and the national governments, because um, in these nine countries that we have assessed so far, I mentioned in my presentation that we have a very nice normative scenario, like the countries are improving in terms of the national policies. They look into the gender aspect, but sometimes this is not necessarily linked with what the institutions are doing. So these collaborative efforts, for example, I think would be uh, very welcome in terms of um, um, how to maintain this, this um, sustainability, right? I understand that's what you asked, the sustainability of those uh, interventions. I think these are the, the aspects I, I could mention now. Thank you. Thanks, Daniela, for your answer. Let's uh, now move on to the second question. And I would like to kindly ask Ms. Sigamoni to provide the first response, please. What are some key challenges encountered in promoting women's participation in higher education leadership and STEM fields and how to address them? For the general audience, I mean, Thank you, Sarah. Yes, so I think uh, some of the, um, hin uh, you know, what we find is for women in higher education and STEM, what we need to do is that um, we need to look at 
currently what we have in place. So, um, you know, we need to have studies, we need to have policies in place, because these are, if we do not change the challenges or address them at the moment, we cannot really progress. So some of the, you know, institutional policies are key. Uh, working with governments to ensure that women are promoted, um, and that there are targets in place. So targets which ensure that women reach these uh, levels. And also uh, we need to monitor the situation to ensure that women stay at these levels as well, because once targets are met, um, we might find that you know the policies are not implemented anymore. So it's really important to have this monitoring and evaluation after policies are in place. But also, as was mentioned during the interventions earlier, um, you know, mentoring, having women believe in themselves, because one of the uh, studies that came out of the World Economic Forum was that women sometimes don't believe that they can actually make it to those positions. So that forms a challenge of women in higher education education at high levels in the education, uh, university or tertiary institution settings. And so mentoring is important for them, uh, training and also ensuring that they reach those levels and they have the support behind them, like childcare and other um, um, support systems in place around them that will ensure that they get to a high le higher level and stay there, but also ensure that other young women come up with them. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Missy Gamoni, uh, for sharing your reflections. And this adds like all of all of our um, uh, guests today, the, our panelists uh, have uh, uh, agreed on, on mentioning that collaboration is important, data is important, monitoring is important. Uh, evaluating is also key uh, and for developing recommendations and, and policies. So uh, let's now invite uh, Ms. Jess to share her thoughts on the same question. What are some key challenges encountered in promoting women's participation in higher education leadership and STEM fields and how to address them? Over to you. Thank you. I think um, like we have a, a good list of the challenges for sure. It's the structures, the formal structures um, that are currently in place, the biases, uh, inherent biases within the, the formal structures and um, the investments, where the investments are going. And so I think that as I think that the connection um, needs to always be there in between higher education, research opportunities, and participation in, in labor, um, the labor force. And so how do we um how do we break down those those barriers? I think the the investment conversation is investing in businesses um, and a variety of businesses, you know, the, the businesses around social enterprises, cooperatives, um, soul soul ventures, um not-for-profit community-based businesses and so putting investments towards the development of those in terms of the recognition of um, how how women want to contribute to the economy and making sure that their contributions lead to economic security uh, is an important piece and the mentorship as uh, Ravani uh, mentioned that that's key in terms of creating a network and, and understanding the intangibles around, um, you know, navigating the higher ed system or, or leadership opportunities within the higher ed system. And then networking, you know, the um, communities of practice and networking, your, your net worth is your network and helping women build strong networks and, and the promotion of that community orientation and different ways of knowing. So honoring the different ways of knowing being that the research focused, but also that I talk a lot about like the intuition um, and and um, the social emotional learning and prioritizing EQ and social emotional learning as a valued um, part of an organization. It's a valued part of a functioning business or um, a functioning team, I think is important. Oh. Thanks, uh, Ms. Jess, for sharing your thoughts uh, and for adding more keywords uh, to, to that, that stay with us. Investment, 
uh, breaking the barriers, uh, networking, and social and emotional learning. Uh, we now proceed to the third question, and I would like to invite Daniele to share with the audience what forward-looking initiatives or strategies are there to continue advancing the progress of women in higher education leadership and STEM fields across Africa? Daniele, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sarah, for the question. Leadership and STEM fields are two elements that in our research we found that the results are not that positive. We look like enrollment, we have significant advancements. We look into the bachelor's um, degree, we have also advancements. We have also the completion rate, right? The graduation rates, they are also um, improving. But we look when we look into STEM and leadership, we don't have a very positive scenario. And this is not only in Africa. Um, two areas that I think, like uh, two main initiatives that comes to my mind now are first the Campus Africa, and the second one is the transforming higher education in Africa, two uh, important flagships taking place at the moment. For example, the Campus Africa is one uh, project that highlights very much the necessity of more data and research so we know what exactly are the interventions that we have to do. For example, in the institutions um, that we want to cover, in the countries that we want to cover, do they have mentorship programs or not? Rovani said, uh, well said, and Roberta has also mentioned this aspect of representation matters. This is super important also for STEM area. They don't see their role models. Um, Rovani said they don't see themselves in those higher seniority leadership positions. And maybe one of the reasons is because they don't really have this representation there. So what are the countries or what are the institutions that do have those mentorship programs or that they don't have? So we need this data in order to know what how we can um, advance. And this is one of the... Um, let's say, areas that the initiative Campus Africa wants to, um, to touch on. Another um, initiative that I, I could mention here is our research on gender-based violence, which is also one of the reasons why um, students, particularly female students, um, leave higher education institutions in some countries, right? Um, this, this lack of, um, let's say, responses from the institutions when they surface such form of violence, so we are uh, advancing in the in the study in the in, in the project in order to understand what are the main reasons, uh, what is the rationale behind the problem, and then what are the institutions actually doing, and then based on that we can also planning to do some recommendations. Um, and to finalize, um, I'm Sarah. You asked like what are the the interventions, right? What are the uh, projects or initiatives that we have now to advance? Um, in my presentation and also Rowan, we have mentioned some preliminary data from um, the current status of the research where we are now, and we are expanding that to another 16 um, countries where we will, um, let's say, scale up what we are doing so far. So this is also something that I would like to um, call the attention uh, of the audience here um, and once again ask for your, let's say, um, support in order to follow what we are doing and uh, check our results. Thank you. Thank you, Daniele, for your response and, and for adding more information, for highlighting the, highlighting the importance of, of Campus Africa and also the importance of representation, role models, and for bringing up the, the theme of gender-based violence in higher education. I would like to kindly uh, now ask uh, Ms. Sigamoni to provide her response to the same question. What forward-looking initiatives or strategies are there to continue advancing the progress of women in higher education leadership and STEM fields across Africa? Ms. Gamoni, the floor is yours. Thank you, Sarah. Um, yes, I mean, I reiterate everything that Danielle said. I think that, you know, within the program of UNESCO, these are initiatives that we have, but also then looking forward, um, when we look at the 2063 um, agenda of the African Union, we find that there are specific targets for 30% of women in STEM in Africa by 2030. Um, and so, you know, these are also targets that UNESCO is working on that um, um, other organizations are working on for the continent, for women on the continent to also then increase these numbers. Of course, it wouldn't happen overnight and we need a systemic change 
as I said, you know, across uh, communities, across countries, across um, families to also be part of this. And um, I think Roberta also mentioned that we also have to go back to the school. So looking at higher education institutions alone to get more women in and to change, you know, the strategies and initiatives for the future, we have to also look at the school level and tertiary and primary school as well will we'll come into this. But uh, also the SDGs are another uh, way that we have as a strategy to ensure that we get more women into higher education and STEM. And I think just by monitoring it, I mean, the report that we've done now shows that although sub-Saharan Africa as a whole has a specific, uh, you know, when we look at the data in sub-Saharan Africa, it is against the trend of the world. But our report shows that in Southern Africa, in the nine countries that we studied in, sub in Southern Africa, we seem to find the trends that are global which in a sense means that we are working on increasing the numbers, but we are also not so far off. So I think we need to do this on a regional aspect. And as Danielle said, we want to also include more countries into our study so that we look at more and then we can also have a perspective for all of Africa. Thanks, Sarah. Thank you, Robani. And um, the last question that we would like you to discuss is the following. Uh, how can partnership between governments, universities, and the nonprofit sector contribute to sustainable improvements in gender equity in higher education? Uh, we would like to invite Ms. Mali Bassett uh, to uh, respond it. Over to you, Roberta. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, I think this is the only way that we'll have sustainability in the improvement of uh, the, the experience of women and girls in Africa, the experience of working class boys in other parts of the world. It's with a collaborative effort across all the actors who are paying attention to the issue and have the ability to impact on the ground. So, you know, even a conversation like this where the, the African Union comes in, UNESCO's here, ILSAC's here, the World Bank is here. We have someone from a nonprofit that she's developed herself here. The, these actors are all working towards a shared goal and the only power comes when we all work together. So more events like this, but also more uh, collaborations around actual activities, right? So these conversations need to lead to actions, the actions that we all can help implement. And I think when that happens, we have sustainable change. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Roberta for reminding us the importance of uh, not only collaborating, but also uh, acting um, be beyond uh, these conversations. Uh, um, I would like to invite now uh, Ms. Jess to answer the same question. How can partnerships between governments, universities, and the nonprofit sector contribute to sustainable development improvements in gender equity in higher education? Uh, I would agree with everything Roberta said and, and add um, the missing is the industry there in that, that partnership. So as we think about creating lifelong learning um, institutions and mindsets and economies and communities, it really comes down to the where we're um, where we're placing these individuals in leadership roles after um, their their higher ed or learning experiences, and it's a continual journey um, that we have to ensure that you know when they're in the workforce that the learning continues. And so, um, in terms of the partnership, just going back to the the experiential learning, career connected learning opportunities, and that ongoing dialogue and action oriented research around um, the what is required, what is the skill set required, where are the gaps, and how can research inform um, the development um, in closing those gaps. And so. Um, the, it, it is a network, it's an ecosystem, and I think with the inclusion of the, the industry into your, um, your list there of government, uh, higher ed, not-for-profit, community-based, uh, we have a solution that can provide um, a more resilient workforce, a more inclusive workforce, and, and greater security for women.
Uh, thanks, uh, Martha, for your for responding this last question, and thanks to all the panelists for sharing their experiences and their insights in today's celebration on the advances on the path towards gender equality in higher education leadership and STEM. To close this event, we would like to invite Peter Wells, head of education at the UNESCO Regional Office of Southern Africa to share with us concluding remarks. Over to you, Mr. Wells. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear Excellent. you and see you okay. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, uh, and uh, first of all, uh, congratulations everybody on International Women's Day. This session has been really remarkable in, in unpacking some of the really key issues we have surrounding women in higher education, STEM, but also girls in STEM. And I'm, I'm not going to try and summarize all the discussions that have gone before, but uh, Ravani said something that resonated me, with me when she said, have women believe in themselves? But I also think it's girls. I think it's girls believing in themselves. We have, UNESCO has a program called uh, Sustainability Starts with Teachers, but STEM starts with teachers. Women start with teachers and girls. And I think this is something that uh, bringing together everything that's been said today, which is all very important. We heard about data. We heard about uh, uh, the need for data. We heard about inclusion. We heard about um, improving progression for women in higher education leadership roles. But it all comes down to ultimately at the primary, secondary level. And I think there's something that we really need to focus on. Uh, so I want to thank all of the speakers for to, uh, to uh, Daniela, to uh, Martha, to Roberta, and of course, Ravani and you, Sarah, for uh, this very vibrant discussion, which can only be the springboard for the next steps. One thing, it, it dawned on me this morning when I was thinking about uh, today's session. 30 years ago in 1994, on International Women's Day 94, I was li living in Florida, the US, and I was studying in Florida. And the International Women's Day speaker was a lady called Bell Hooks. Her real name, I think, was I think is something like Gloria Watkins. But she went by the name of Bell Hooks. And she was an inter, she unfortunately she passed away in 21. But she was uh, an educationalist, a feminist, an educator, and thought thinker. And so I Googled her this morning. And I remember she was promoting at that time, she was promoting a publication of hers, which I've written down here, called Teaching to Transgress. Education as the Practice of Freedom. And I remembered this quote from that book. And she said this, once you do away with the idea of women and people as fixed static entities, then you see that people can change and there is hope. It's about what we do, not just what we feel. And so, I think that encapsulates what you've all been talking about today. We can think about things, we can talk about things, we can feel it, but what we need to do is action. And I think one of the colleagues said this in this, uh, their final remarks. So with that, I will close. Thank everybody on behalf of ESL. Thank you for all the speakers who've taken their time to be here. Thank you for the audience for joining us. and. Let's make this 8th of March count 24 and move ahead. And next year, we will have something more important and more positive to report. Thank you so much, Sarah, and thank you to everybody.
Thanks, Peter, uh, for your very positive uh, closing remarks, especially for closing with this idea of girls and women believing in themselves and also for putting the hoods today. On behalf of uh, the team at UNESCO Yesalak and UNESCO Regional Office of Southern Africa, we would like to thank our distinguished guests today uh, for their participation and to all of you for attending this event to commemorate International Women's Day. We invite you to explore our website, yesal.unesco.org and connect with us through our social media platforms to stay updated on our initiatives related to gender and higher education. And uh, let us together continue celebrating all the initiatives for breaking the gender gap in STEM and everywhere else. Have a nice day.